Discipline and consistency separate the good from the great. Welcome to the Millionaire Woman Show, where we'll be discussing leadership, business, human potential, inspiring you to live rich from the inside out. Unlock your creativity, stretch out of your comfort zone, break through your barriers, take inspired action, and achieve epic results. Now here's your host, three-time best-selling author, speaker, and certified executive coach, Deborah Kozowski. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Millionaire Woman Show. I'm your host, Deborah Kozowski, and I've always got something exciting planned for you. And today, I'm going to introduce to you our guest speaker who just hails with a wealth of knowledge. And when I go through her bio, man, you guys are going to be amazed. Nikita Ren Thigpen is a licensed, it's certified social worker who broke barriers, glass ceilings nearly 10 years ago when she architected her professional skill set as a psychotherapist, trauma specialist, sexologist, and relationship expert with stra strategically infusing the tenets of breakthrough success coaching to raise the bar and create ripples inside of personal development industry. Now regarded as the number one balance and relationship advisor in the world, Nikita has become our go-to for fast scaling married women entrepreneurs who and power couples seeking to balance love and success without dimming or apologizing for their spirited ambition. As a creator of Breakthrough Paradigm, The Joy Map Method, international best-selling author of the book Selfish, transform transformative empowerment speaker, CEO of Fig Pro Pen, uh, Fig Pro Balance, pardon me, and Relationship Management Institute, Nikita and her team set out every day to inspire, equip, and empower her client partners to amplify intimacy 360 degrees across all key relationships so that they can create joy and achieve whole success. Committed just as much to breaking the barriers she is to living full, a full living the life she teaches others. Nikita creates safe spaces, crucial conversation as a leading podcast host, wife, mother, ministry, and G bunny. That's a grandmother. Welcome to the show, Nikita. That is quite the, not just the bio, but the diversity of what you've created for yourself. And I love how you've melded all of these skill set into creating who you are. Because I know often people, when they move from career to career or, you know, have different interests that pulls them in different directions, people are often surprised at, mm -hmm. you know, they don't necessarily think that some of those skills are transformed transferable but what you've taken is you've packaged them and that's just completely amazing thank you deborah thank you for welcoming me here i'm excited and i'm looking forward to it and all of the whole phenomenal i want to use the g word the gangster that we're going to bring to tonight well, for those <laughs> it's going to be fun. Just listening to us on the air um we nikita and i both showed up in hoodies today and i know that's not traditionally what you see me wear but today Same. in Canada, it's a, a, there's an anti-bullying campaign called Pink Shirt Day, and it's all about bringing about kindness. So I'm wearing a pink hoodie, so you'll have to come check us out on YouTube because um, we're uh, hanging out here in what we're going to call our gangster mode. And uh, <laughs> love to share this with you. And Nikita is wearing an entrepreneur sweatshirt. So yes. we're in the right place hanging out together here. Now, Nikita, what got you involved, you know, from psychotherapist, trauma specialist, I, I see somehow that some of that ties in, mm -hmm. a sexology and relationship expert, how have you been able to tie this all together to yeah. create this massive mission that you're out to do? Thank you for asking. So for me, it was very much like how you run your podcast, organic and always in flow right? Uh, for me, growing up as a trauma survivor, I had my own multi-systemic traumas that I had to grow through in a very dysfunctional family. So that led me to wanting to understand people, like how you tick, why you do the things you do, what's wrong with you, what's wrong with me, right? All the things that would lead you into the helping um, professions and many 
many people lead that way in different ways. Some doctors, lawyers, you know, whatever. I chose to be an active listener who would eventually become a diagnostician. Uh, so I went to undergrad for psychology, sociology, and anthropology. I was pre-med at the time. I just thought I was going to be a pediatrician with a psychiatry practice, a psychology, excuse me, practice on the side of my house. I was very ambitious to say the least. Um, and then I hit organic chemistry and calculus and said, this is not my life. This is not what I want. <laughs> you were definitely my sister. I took organic chemistry and I took calculus and they were a swear word to me in university. It, it, it's same, exactly. Um, I, I think I started to make up swear words by that point. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I still had a heart for people. I still wanted to help. I still wanted to be in a position to really hear not just the presenting problem that someone might say, like, oh, I have time management issues. Oh, you know, I'm not getting along with my parents or my spouse. I wanted to really understand the rooted issues of what was going on with people. And that led me down the, the road of going further and further in my education to becoming a clinician. Uh, so once I became a licensed clinical social worker and trauma was the, the rooted force of everything that I was learning, understandably, because I could relate to it. I wanted to help people in the darkest corners of their, their lives, which for many people were when they were stuck in their trauma. Their traumas might have been stuck in their body, um, as well as their mind and in their energy and in blocking the flow of them performing at their best level. Well, that performance, it, you know, it inhibits you in every area of your life, including your bedroom. So if you're dealing with a lot of trauma and you're holding it in your body, regardless of the type, it does not have to be sexual abuse. It does not have to be physical abuse. The ones that we kind of justify as having a quality understanding of that, that justifies as a trauma, right? When you're sexually abused or physically victimized, but you could have had all kinds of trauma happen to you. And if it locked in your body, it's really hard for you to have healthy relationships, platonic healthy relationships, let alone dating positive people who are not toxic, let alone marrying people or really, you know, being committed in monogamous relationships if you are still stuck in your own body with your own trauma. So that's where the sexology piece kind of came in for me is once I had people in a sacred space and they started to share with me how their challenges that would show up, sometimes they would call it trauma, sometimes they wouldn't, how it was impacting them at home from the boardroom to the bedroom, that really made me want to understand it fully. So I went down the rabbit hole because I'm a nerd. So what do nerds do? You get educated, right? <laughs> We're definitely at the right place. I, I'm a self-professed nerd as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's really interesting to me because, you know, I've been doing some studying in this area of trauma-informed care yeah. and uh, really understanding that and, and not you know, um, downplaying anyone's event. Let's just put that out, out front here right now. Always. But there's that, what, and it could be different things of how some people might go through the same event and not have trauma. Right. And the meaning they place on the event doesn't make the trauma any more or any less, but it's how they move through it and how they re recover from it. Is that, is that correct? Absolutely. Uh, someone who is used to what we call micro traumas every day, they may not be phased by being punched in the face by a caregiver, right? For someone who's never had that experience, a caregiver slapping them out of rage because maybe they had too much to the drink or they had a really bad day, that could traumatize that other person in a more significant way than the, the other child, let's just assume these are children, than the child who was getting hit every day it was just a completely different interpretation of their reality based on the norms that they were living in day to day. And, and what I th think I find most fascinating about, you know, the terminology of trauma itself is it's individual interpretation as mm -hmm. well. And, you know, it's not for us to say, well, that has no meaning or you, you're just making it up. It can be as small as an argument, uh, someone placing their hand on you firmly that you don't expect. Mm -hmm. I was amazed to learn that that trauma for th that can be considered trauma for someone and um, yeah. lead to that P PTSD. Absolutely. I mean, think about it. If you feel violated from being in the room where someone else is maybe physically experiencing something, but you feel violated because you're watching this and you feel unsafe, 
that was vicarious trauma for you as the person in the room that didn't physically have that experience and maybe the emotional and verbal abuse wasn't happening towards you, but you were privy to it. That's vicarious trauma. That's what a lot of our, our soldiers that never actually shot anyone or were shot, they experience a lot of vicarious trauma, not just the ones who have injury because of things that were going on. It's when you're privy to that and you feel just as unsafe or even worse, you're unsafe and you feel like you don't, you can't contribute to helping the other person in any kind of helpful way without damaging both of you. It locks you in your body. It's very overwhelming. Yeah. And recently I was taking a course on speaking on breath with uh, Christoph Conrad, mm. breath specialist. And it was interesting how he shared, you know, when we don't release, like we weren't talking about trauma per se, but how we can withhold things in our body. And we were talking about breathing because you'd be shallow breathing. Yep. And not fully taking in the breath or being able to express yourself or as a speaker that you're speaking on stage and you're needing to take breaths more frequently because you have that sense of urgency because you can't get that full breath in. Yeah. And that's why I'm curious. Can you share with us a little bit more about when you talk about some of these emotions, just emotions in general, mm -hmm. getting mm -hmm. trapped in the body? Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought up breathing too, because diaphragm probatic breathing from your belly, belly breathing, as most of us um, would recognize it. If you do yoga or Pilates, you know, if you, if you've watched any of those, they always talk about the belly breath. It's really important that you pull from the core of your belly because it's, it literally massages your organs when you do that. And toxins that are trapped in your organs because of the foods we eat and the beverages we drink and the environments we sit in, those toxins go through our skin and get trapped in our organs. But when you breathe deeply, you massage the organs and you release the toxins from your body, especially if you're flushing with water. So uh, people who are having a lot of skin acne, not just on their faces, but they're noticing it on their body and they're like, I am way past um, you know, teenage years, why is this happening to me in my 40s and 50s? A lot of it is because that energy was stuck in your body, whether it was officially traumatic in terms of the way you've defined it, or if it was a very high stressful experience, a distressful experience that you trapped in your body and never allowed to flow through. The emotions like shame, guilt, uh, anger, resentment, all of those things can get trapped in your body just from literally to use your example earlier of having a bad argument with a coworker, a team member at a networking event. If there's a day when we get to do those again, right? Like you could have really got infuriated with someone. And because you didn't allow that energy, that emotion to flow through your body, it got trapped. And some of us will feel it in different parts of our body. So you may feel it in your shoulder right? I might feel stress in my lower back. Someone else might feel stress all in their belly and they, they, it turns into knots and maybe GI issues that roll into other things. And like, what happened? I didn't, and they go through the list of why well, I didn't eat anything wrong. Um, I didn't drink anything wrong. They do all the environments, but they didn't do a body scan of when I was upset, where did that energy get trapped in my body? Why do I have a knot or a sharp pain or a belly ache, or now I'm nauseous or dizzy? what is going on here, but we'll assume that it's environmental when a lot of it was because of the emotion that we pulled into our body and locked it in a certain part. So is it because people weren't able to emotionally express themselves? Is that where, you know, where we bottle it up until the inopportune moment and just blow it up? Or is it more so that they, like to, when we talk about having the emotion flow through your body in the moment, so it does not get trapped? Yeah, How it's, well, it's a lot of times, you know, when you're ambitious, if you, def if you self-define yourself as ambitious or some people say, well, I'm just a doer, I get things done. You ever hear that from anyone you've ever talked to? Like, oh, I'm just a doer, I get things done. Yeah. A lot of doers, get, get them doneers, whatever you want to call them, they suppress in order to keep moving. So things are hitting them, deadlines, stressful situations. Uh, maybe they're forever love, as I like to call our spouses. Their forever love got on their last good nerve right before they had to do a presentation and they had zero time to process. They just stuff it in. And it's literally, if you think about a container, like a, I don't know, a, a, what do you call those containers we use at home? 
the Tupperware kind of thing. Yes, a Tupperware container. I was trying to think, well, what are the plastic ones called? But anyway, the little Tupperware container, if you think of it with those little cute little lids, you can only pack but so much in there before you can't get the top on anymore. And if you still keep packing stuff in the, to try to get the top on, you will be successful. If you're really brute with your force, like brute force, you'll get that lid to snap on and what will happen? It'll pop right off and hit you in the face, right? And we do that with our emotions, especially when we are go-getters, doers, getter doneers, like all of that. And a lot of it is because that's what we were told is what you're supposed to do. Our parents, our caregivers, our school teachers, our coaches growing up, they showed us, suck it up. We don't cry here. What are you doing? Keep it moving. You're an athlete. Keep going. You're expected to have this. Don't push through or don't be so sensitive. You're too sensitive. What's wrong with you, right? Like they told us in, in actions and in words that it wasn't okay to express our emotions. And then the world celebrated us for not processing our emotions because it was like, oh, Deborah is amazing. She does 55 things in two hours. I don't know how she does it. And they, they're not asking out of curiosity. They're celebrating you. So it's really hard for Deborah to not receive that pat on the back. Like, well, yeah, you know, I actually did do that. <laughs> you know, well. Enforcement. Right? <laughs> yeah. Continue the behavior. Absolutely. And you, you feel guilty for not doing 55 things in two hours, even when you're exhausted when you don't have anything else to give, if your forever love is like, babe, you're doing great things for the world, but I'm not seeing you. We're not getting any cuddle time. We don't have any time for us. We feel like roommates. We have sex and it's a chore. It's not passionate and infused anymore because you're using all of your energy for the world. Maybe you're chasing the at a girl, at a boy, maybe you're not, but you're so used to being on skates for the world that you're not literally giving yourself permission to slow down, mm -hmm. process, feel the feels, let them flow, get them out of your body so that you can speed up and dominate tomorrow. So what would be like one of your top recommendations for people when, when they experience an emotional um, event to, so they don't get it trapped in their body because it often can lead to illness. Yeah, it does. Uh, Stress-induced illnesses is very major. Diabetes, stroke, heart attacks, high blood pressure, like all, many of them have been linked primarily to stress-induced illnesses that then kind of churn into other, other things and, and link diagnosis, autoimmune diseases, all kinds of things. Um, so I'm a little bold in my thinking and my teaching in it. People literally pay me to help them be more selfish. Uh, and I know that word has a lot of provocativeness around it because especially as women we've taken that in as a negative because that's what we were taught to do to pull it in as a negative word so I give my nerve brain turns on and I give a little history lesson for anyone who has like contentious feelings around the word selfish uh, somewhere between 1620 and 1649 because you know depending on what book you look it up the dates change there was a Caucasian Pentecostal some say Catholic again based on the history bishop who said selfish is bad. And so it got into the lexicon because we know religions rule anything from the 1600s. If you were part of the Catholic church, what you said, if you were a high ranking official, it got put into the dic dictionary period and it never got questioned again. Um, if you go deeper into the mythology of all of it, the reason that that bishop said selfish is wrong is because the women were coming because you're supposed to go to your pastor, your priest, your bishops to get permission for everything. They were praying for forgiveness because they found themselves not wanting to have sex with their husbands whenever their husbands wanted to. They like wanted to have the, I don't know, the option to say, no, <laughs> not now. And the bishop basically said, well, if you don't do what your husband has told you to do because it's God's command, then you are being selfish. And that word got in the dictionary. So you can see why I have a problem with it. I can't say no to my husband. I can't choose when I want my body touched and when I don't want my body touched. Yeah. This is 2021, but we're still holding on to the history of that word. And we deemed it as bad. And we say things like, well, self-care isn't selfish. I say, yes, it is. When you stop breastfeeding the world and you say, stop, I'm not doing this right now. I'm going to focus on me. I'm going to fill my own cup, my own bottle. I'm going to hydrate, take a moment and not to avoid having a, a meltdown just because I want to. Not with the excuse of, oh, I'm about to burn out. So other people will justify that and say, oh, 
Nikita's about to burn out, let her have a minute. That shouldn't be the only reason your family, your friends, your coworkers, your team give you a minute is because you're about two minutes from exploding. You should have those minutes so you don't have to explode. So you can process your issues, you know, your toxic relationships, be able to forgive yourself for mistakes that you made. So I've redefined and reclaimed selfishness as something that I'm empowered by is I feel like it's a personal intimate gift to create my own joy. When I'm selfish, I can point the finger at myself and say, all right, girl, what do you have to do? What's going on with you? Why were you so snappy with your 20 year old? What, what's going on with you that you, you were cutting with your husband or your energy was short with your team member? Like what's happening with you? And I can link it to, oh, okay. I see I was triggered. I found myself people pleasing because that's my past issue, right? Like I found myself in this trap. So let me do the work. And I can literally give myself permission to pause and be intentionally selfish for the reason of filling myself up so that I can overflow selflessly without resentment and regret. So I literally tell people, bring in the concept of being selfish and understand that it's not bad unless you are in the 1600s and you don't want to ever have to say no to anyone. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more, you know, this movement of self-love has yeah. become more of a buzzword that I've been hearing. You know, I've heard a lot about self-care, but recently I've learned that a lot of that, and for those of you listening, I have a little uh, video on that as well on the YouTube channel, what's self-love got to do with it. But to really yes. think about what's the difference between self-love and self-care and my understanding it is is actually has a lot to do with how you talk to yourself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I'd separate self-love and self-care really simply. Self-care is the doing. Self-love is the being. Mm. Um, when we're doing, you know, our manis, our petties, our massages, our, you know, hydrating with good liquids and eating solids and fruit and seeds and all the things, that's good self-care. And that is a part of loving yourself, right? Like when you're putting, because I heard your other podcast too, I think it was one of your recent episodes where you were talking about that um, with the fitness instructor, um, who's amazing, by the way, but that's another conversation. <laughs> when you guys were talking about it, when you're pouring into your body, that absolutely is a form of self, self-love, self right? Yeah. It's the same as hugging your children is a form of loving them, but it's not the same as them loving themselves. It's just a piece of it. You show them with your doing and your embracing of them. You're showing your body with your putting good things in and taking time for many petties and meditation and all the things. But when you truly love yourself, you can look at yourself in the mirror look at yourself, not criticize yourself. Yeah. So I do a lot of things um, in the work that we do privately and in our Unbound Brilliance Lab, where we're doing mirror techniques, where we're literally staring at ourselves. You have to be backed up just enough so you can see your whole body and you're looking in your eyes, telling yourself, I forgive you. I love you. You're worthy. Mm -hmm. You're deserving you are lovable, like being able to really say that. And sometimes you'll cry, you'll break down, you'll have a melt because the eyes are the windows to the soul. And if you're looking at yourself into your eyes and not like, oh, mm, you got a blemish here up, oh, you know, what's happening? You're oily right here. Like if you're not doing that kind of stuff in the mirror and you're really loving on yourself, that's when you're fueling yourself energetically and spiritually with all the things that you already have, but it's been calcified under the chaos of your life, all those scripts that we grew up with, you're not enough, you know, you're too much. I know a lot of women that I know have heard that. Oh, you are too much. People can't take you or my, the favorite, oh, Deborah, you're intimidating. You have to be careful because some people might see you as intimidating. Like, did you ever get that in your life? <laughs> I that and I was actually shocked. Exactly. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. it's, it just fascinates me. And the other thing that when I, when I think about this, um, self-love and that self-talk is, you know, we're going to be move into heating some things up in our conversation, but also that if you can't look in the mirror and see yourself as whole and that, that can interrupt that intimacy in the bedroom and not that, that confidence that you show in the boardroom or when you want to ask for something that you really want. Mm -hmm. A thousand percent. It's, um, I talk a lot about deep, deep connection and creating that connection. Of course, we get very deep when we're talking about our forever love, like, you know, in the bedroom, but you can create deeper connections with people you work with professionally, you know, like we say through the boardroom. And it does start with communicating. 
uh, being aware of your own challenges, actually making time to love yourself. So before you say, oh, well, I don't have time for my family. I don't have time for my kids. I don't have time to go to all my sister's you know, kids, my niece and nephew's third recital of the day, like I don't have time. Well, of course you don't because you're not actually slowing down to have time for yourself. So you can't fathom making time to make love to your, your boo, right? Like it's really hard if you're like, I have three minutes a day to pee and, you know, getting a bio break is really hard for me. It is unfathomable for you to think about making space for them. And in fact, you start to resent it it really becomes a chore. And you feel the same way when your, your friend from childhood invites you to her third divorce party. There's no judgment about her being in a, you know, a fourth, getting ready for her fourth new love because she's decided that the first three didn't work for her. Congratulations to her that she made bold decisions about what she wouldn't tolerate. However, that doesn't mean that you have space in your schedule to now shift for four more events because you know what that looks like yeah. versus you having some boundaries around your time and saying like, you know what, I could go to, I'll call her Lisa, I could go to Lisa's third divorce party and probably have a good time for about 20 minutes because the other three and a half hours of that four hour event, I'm thinking about the laundry I didn't get done, the proposal I still have to write, the setup I have to do for the next day, the 2.5 other people in my household that are already complaining they don't see me and whatever other dynamic that is. So you're sitting in these spaces and your physical being not fully present. Um, and it's really hard if you're doing that, then you can't, and you're refusing to really, not just you can't, but you're not communicating your needs. So when we talk about the bedroom, if I can't communicate to you that I like it right here on the nape of my neck, but I don't like it when you're behind me because that's a trigger for me. If I can't communicate that with you and I'm being quiet and I'm suppressing the way that I do with everything else, because I'm a doer, I'm just going to get through it. I'm just going to go. Then, yep, we were physical. We were connected physically, but there was no emotional intimacy. I wasn't in love with you in that moment. I loved you enough to sacrifice myself, but making love to your forever love, your person that the person that you're consenting to be with shouldn't be a, a get it done and get it over with. It should be a, I've been waiting for this all day one day. I can, you know, like I've been running for this. But if you're not able to communicate your needs, everything feels like a job. Yeah. Cause it, and it takes you away from desire because you're really getting focused on tasks. And sometimes I wonder if people understand like that deep connection in, in relationships within an organization, they do have a certain level of intimacy, uh, professional inti intimacy. Absolutely. Right? Versus the bedroom. But they're correlated in how deep the connection is. And, you know, tell us a little bit more about, you know, when it's in the boardroom, how can mm -hmm. we form those deep connections? Yeah. Without people thinking it's bordering on into any type of, you know, leading somewhere else. Yeah, and appropriateness, right? Because well, you want your professional relationships to be professional and any friendships that come out of it have to be consensual, regardless of what direction they go in. Yeah. So um, just backing up for a minute, what I like to clarify for people is intimacy is just deeper connection. That's all it means. Our 10 year old brains like to pervert it, right? And like, as soon as we say intimacy, we're like, ooh. And yes, when you're an adult and you're of consenting an age, a consenting age, of course, we can bring in all the juicy goodness of the other parts of that piece of physical intimacy, but it's the smallest part. Intimacy is 360 degrees in all our relationships. There's leadership intimacy, you're not having sex with your leaders, hopefully. There's customer intimacy, you're not having sex sex with your customers, hopefully, right? Like there's intimacy. And so there's brand intimacy. Is your brand having sex with another brand, right? Like, no, because it's so much more than that. So when we're in the boardroom, so to speak, when we're in those professional relationships that we want to stay professional, but we want to deepen the intimacy, it starts with just listening. Like instead of coming prepared to the meeting to the point that your agenda is so tight, there's no room for anyone to converse with you. There's no space. I know my husband used to accuse me of that. My husband is a co-owner in the company with me. And he used to say all the time, years ago, he was like, this is a conversation, right? Like when we're having our shareholders meeting, cause I like, I had my agenda and I'm type A. So boom, 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 boom. Like, let's get it done. And he's like, uh, I have something to say, hello. Right? Like he wanted to be a part of the conversation and not just be in the room listening to me flow through the agenda with a bunch of to-dos or 
I already got it done. I'm just kind of reporting to you. And we do that a lot in our professional relationships. We want to look and be, because some people aren't just doing it for optics. They want to be so prepared that you don't leave any room for the conversation, for the communication to happen where someone might actually give you some constructive feedback to tweak it. And part of why we do that is because we don't want to be rejected. We receive constructive feedback as rejection. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I hear that a lot because, you know, and even if you have differing opinions, people think that it damages that intimacy, that deep connection mm -hmm. because they want everybody to agree, but disagreement does not equal rejection. It doesn't. I mean, if, if I were to go to the other side in the bedroom, friction is really what makes everything juicy, right? Like when there's friction physically, that's when things get popping. That's when it goes. If we were just always in the same rhythm we were both up and up and down and down at the same time there's no friction there's nothing juicy and good and feeling and spontaneous in that and it's the same way in the conversations professionally if you don't allow for any friction to happen no juicy innovation is going to happen no good creativity is going to come out of that if everyone is just like yes Nikita yes absolutely everything you say is gold that's perfect you're just allowing me to as one of my aunts would say like you left me, you let me leave this house with my slip hanging you know the, the elders in the family were in the slips right yeah. uh, and and that's what she would say if you didn't correct her like don't be afraid to correct me because you're letting me lead here like in my my private sacred space in this boardroom we're all working on the same mission hopefully with different elements of the vision outside of this we have to have each other's back so if you don't correct me give me guidance support constructive criticism granted it has to be constructive it can't be you know hateful and disrespectful and your tone and your demeanor. But if you're not doing that, then you're letting me go out here with my slip hanging. Now I'm representing the brand, the company, um, I'm approaching potential customers, not looking the best all because you didn't wanna tell me that there were some things that I could potentially improve. And it's on me to take that information and not use it, but it's on you to open your mouth and to say it. Yeah. And when, and when we hear people offer compliments or that first impression you know it really leads us to deciding whether or not how, how much we're going to show up in that yeah. boardroom and being able to have that communication so what would be five ways to deepen the connection whether it be with your forever love or even in the boardroom like to have those meaningful conversations um because i do know that when you have that connection you're able to be a little bit more vulnerable yeah, no, that's a great question. So it goes the same in either space, the bedroom or the boardroom. We just use different language, right? Because we have different um, outcomes that we're going after, hopefully, <laughs> from the bedroom to the boardroom. But it goes back to, I call it like catch and keep, catch them and keep them because you don't want to just catch something and keep releasing it. Now, if you're in the dating game, this is a little bit different. Because obviously, if you're dating, you don't want to keep everything you catch because not everything is catch worthy, right? <laughs> but um, if you are pretty sure that this is the person, this is the relationship personally, this is the customer because they match your ideal client, your avatar, whatever your, you know, kind of branding um, nuances are behind the scenes. You do want to keep them. You don't want to have to just keep getting new clients all the time. You get the right person and they become your brand ambassadors. Mm -hmm. You catch the right forever love. They become the person that helps to make your great greater because you should already be great when you come to the table, right? Um, so I literally call it catch because it's C-A-T-C-H. And we just uh, were talking about just a little, little bit of it before for the five ways to deepen your connection. Uh, the first is to be really consistent with whatever you're claiming that you're gonna complete and that you're gonna do, the doers in the, in the room that are listening to this right now, if you say that you are going to take out the trash every day, as an example, then take out the trash, be consistent. Don't do it for two weeks because you just had an argument about it. You said you were gonna do better. You did better for two weeks and then you slowly but surely let that go. Because what happens is you've broken trust. Now, whoever, whether professionally or personally, they feel like they can't trust you. In fact, they get to the point where they're clocking. Yep, Nikita does that for about two to three weeks and then she's back to doing, you know, whatever she was doing before. And it gets frustrating when people can't rely on you. So if I'm your forever love and I know that you aren't consistent, 
I'm not going to give you some of the most vulnerable parts of me because you have shown me that I can't trust you. And it might have been something as small as the dishes or the trash, or uh, maybe you said you would, you know, stop cussing at me or something, you know, it might have been something like that. But I've taken that holistically and I've embodied that from a safety level. You're not a safe person. I can't trust you. Right, micro breaks in trust. Yes, the, and that these are all micro breaks. And of course, this looks the same in the boardroom, right? So kind of same thing, but you're going, you're dealing with different language and your, your consistency because again, you're going for different outcomes most of the time. Yes. Although I know a lot of people that found their forever love at work. So that's a whole different conversation. Um, the A is for awareness. You have to be willing to do the work on yourself. You know how we say you point the finger at someone there's three fingers pointing back at you like that right like that's what awareness is about you have to be willing to be really mindful when you're in connection with someone and you're trying to to deepen you got to be careful not to project something on them if you have attachment issues uh maybe your one of your parents abandoned you you can't now put that on this other person right? You have to be really careful. You might show up too needy. You might show up too mama or papa bear like, and those things can be a signal for other people to run. And you're trying to figure out like, what happened? Like I was the best girlfriend. I did everything right. It was, you were projecting some things because you weren't self-aware of what that looked like. Um, so just being really mindful and that work takes work. It is simple, but not easy. It's simple to say, okay, I have problems. It's not easy to actually do the work without guidance and support. I, I don't want to interrupt the acronym, but I do have to ask, can, can yeah. you share a little bit more about projection? Yeah. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Projection is unfortunately very natural for most humans. It does not matter what your gender is or what you identify as. Um, most of us project whatever the inadequacy is that's within us. So if my inadequacy is, um, I'm short. So I'm just going to pick on something silly so no one gets too emotional as they listen to this. But I'm five foot two. So if my inadequacy is that I'm short and I'm constantly in a room full of tall people that I have to look up and I have to hold myself and I have to wear the five inch heels and I have to do all these things, then I'm walking in overcompensating, right? Because my inadequacy is I feel small. I feel like, and it goes deeper. I feel small. I feel like I don't belong. Why am I here? What gives me just a bit, like, doesn't matter that heck, I might have been the one getting the award, doesn't matter. But if that's my inadequacy, I have a whole narrative around why I don't belong. So then two things will happen. I'm either going to overcompensate by being an emotional bully when I walk in the room, almost making people, I'm projecting on them how I'm feeling and making them feel how I feel because I'm so afraid of someone seeing how I feel on the inside, like I don't belong, like why is she here, what's going on? Or I'm gonna shrink all the way back and I'm not gonna be the emotional bully, I'm just gonna be self-injurious to myself. So you'll see uh, a person like this in this example, you'll see them self-deprecating. They'll pick on themselves to get a laugh out of you, to make you feel comfortable. They'll start highlighting like, oh yeah, you know, cause if I didn't have these, these high heels on, you guys wouldn't even be able to see me. You could crush me like, eh. like, you know, saying silly, but self-deprecating things that it's nothing wrong with being playful and making fun of yourself and doing all that. But when you're doing it for that reason, when you're projecting, because you're so afraid that if you you don't do it to yourself first. You won't be able to handle what you think is in the perspective minds of someone else. Right. It can and cause a lot of damage. Yeah. And the people in the mm -hmm. room could be very comfortable with you and have no issues wondering what the heck you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Now, now you're making every, they're uncomfortable for you, right? If you're on the other end where you're self-deprecating and you're, you're really self-injuring yourself emotionally, verbally, you know, all the ways it's uncomfortable for everyone. And now people don't, now they don't know how to take you. They don't know if you belong in the room because you're telling, you're giving signals that you're not sure that you belong there. It's like going to a surgeon whose hand is shaking. Um, excuse me, if you're not comfortable in doing this surgery, I'm not sure that I want you to do it on me, right? Yeah. No, it's fascinating. So C, consistency, A, awareness, and let's get you back. Yeah. So, taking on that uh, tangent, but it, it's, I'm always very curious about projection. No, it's powerful and purposeful. So thank you for asking me. Um, the T is the time, right? You're making time for me. I always say you got to make time for me time before you make time for we time. I know you want to spend more 
time with your family. I know that they've been on you because you are ambitious and a go-getter. You've been in school all their life. They, they don't remember the last time you weren't studying for something or taking a course in, or a certificate, right? Like they're like, she or he, they're always doing something. And I get it. You, you finally want to be the person who can participate. But if you don't have anything in you to do it, you're going to go and you're going to be inauthentic. And is that who you want to be? Do you want to be the fake person who's pretending to want to be in the room, virtual room or in person? Do you want to come to Deborah's podcast and, and have the honor of being interviewed, but wishing that you were somewhere else because you don't have any energy? Or do you want to show up and show up fully and take advantage of this privilege and opportunity that you have to do it? So just being really mindful, it's me time before we time. Even if it's 15 minutes, it doesn't have to be you know, two weeks or like I do six weeks self-lovecations. I get that that's a privilege and not everybody can or wants to be by themselves that long. I love me a lot. So I, I want to be with me a lot, a lot, a lot. Yeah. But it, it took me a long time and a lot of therapy to be able to be with me to the point where I'm like, not just for 15 minutes, I want so much more of it. And because I can do that, I can get to the other C, which is communicating your needs. Like I can tell my husband exactly how to touch me, love me, feel me, don't do this, don't do that. I can also communicate, you know what? I felt really uncomfortable this morning when I asked you a question and you just stared at me. And it wasn't about physical intimacy. It was about lack of communication. And without I, someone getting defensive. Or without, exactly. Just yeah. As is. Yeah, and you know, your awareness of yourself that A, helps you communicate in a way that's at least less triggering. You can't say it'll never be triggering because you don't know everyone's triggers, right? But you can be less triggering because you're not pulling in your own projective crap into it. And if you do, you can catch it along the way. We're human, it comes up, right? Someone puts their finger in your face. Most of us aren't gonna back away and turn the other cheek, right? <laughs> like it's, it's gonna pull up some childhood stuff like, oh, you're, you're threatening me. But if you've done the awareness, you can take a step back and communicate, okay, I really would like it if you put your hands down. That that feels uncomfortable to me. You might just be an, like I talk with my hands all the time. You might just be an animated person and you meant nothing by it, but it's triggering for me. And I'm communicating that I need you to put that down. So at least we can get on the same page and it does make a difference. H. H is honor your agreements. Mm -hmm. It wraps right back to that first C of being consistent. The honoring your agreements really is just a matter of you being clear with yourself from a, a space of integrity. You're not just being consistent in the thing that you said you were going to do. You're actually doing it. You're actually doing it in the first place before you could even break anything consistent. And you're also communicating if this doesn't feel good anymore. So I tell people all the time, break the expectation, starting with yourself. So if you told yourself when you were five that you were going to be a pediatrician with a psychology practice on the side of your house, and you realized at 25, it's not my jam, this is not what I want anymore. Are you going to hold yourself to that expectation because you said that you would do it, or you know, maybe you even shared it with family and friends. Maybe your parents said, well, all the women in our family are lawyers, all the men are doctors. So that's your choice. You don't have an option. You break their expectation, and but start with breaking your own. So you can start to honor your agreements, the agreement of what you really want, the agreement of what you want in this marriage. And the same thing happens in our relationship. When we were 20 or 30 or 40 and we were in lust with each other before we actually fell in love and all the things, we probably made some agreements that actually don't work for us right now while we're committed and we've lived life and we have grown woman weight and cellulite and other things, right? Like there's some things that we were willing to do when we were younger, clothes we were willing to wear because it excited you that, mm, no, I'm not doing that now <laughs> and being okay with it. Because I think we get caught up in the narrative of, mm -hmm. you know, um, the narrative that we need to hold on to that same agreement, that belief, when as we evolve, those beliefs and agreements change. And they should. Deborah, you, oh, fuck, I want to shake my maracas right now. You, that, like, you, you hit the nail on the head. You should evolve. If someone is coming up to you and they know you, I don't know, when you were 17, if they're like, girl, you ain't changed a bit, I am offended. 
what like I hope you're saying that because it's just a normal thing to say and people just don't know what to say out of their mouths when they haven't seen you in a long time but if you really mean it if you're meeting me 30 years later 40 years later and saying I haven't changed a bit there's a problem yeah and and I think there is some people who do not grow and evolve and it's uh, really challenging to stay in relationship with them yeah um and part of it is because they don't want to grow they're holding themselves to their glory days. They're afraid of being rejected in their wisdom of what they should have at this moment. If, you, if you're human, you've lived a life, you've got some experience under your belt, you know better in certain spaces and places of your thinking, but you may choose not to do better because back in the day when you were the jock, back in the day when you were the cool kid, right? Back in the day when everyone came to you for fashion advice, you still wanna be that person where the reality is you're not even interested in half of those things anymore. But if you're not allowing yourself to grow, then you're also attracting people who are also stunted. And I mean that professionally and personally. Yeah. So what does it mean to be intentionally selfish so that it really brings up the heat, whether it be in the bedroom or in the boardroom? Yeah, this is my favorite. Um, so I'm going to use, I have to change just a little bit because this is a, a real client and I want to make sure they're not ousted um, when I share this. Um, so something that is an example of intentionally selfish, most of our, our mates have become so, they're so used to our rote reactions, right? Like we're so routine um, to the point that it's, it's mediocre, mediocre. It's, there's no flame anymore because it's like yeah no I know that when you put on the t-shirt and you didn't put on panties I know that we're going to have sex tonight I know that if you were in the shower for a long amount of time that we're going right like they just know us they know us so well but when you start being really clear about what you want which is easier said than done but if you're like you know what I actually don't want to be penetrated tonight I actually only want to play with my tongue. I only want you to play with your tongue. I don't even want you to use tongues. I want you to dip your fingers in some honey and rub the honey all over me and figure out a creative way to get it off of me, right? Like when you start to think about textures and things that you want and goes back to that catch, when you communicate what you want in there, you've surprised the other person, you've brought creativity and adventure back into your bedroom you pull them into a space of unexpected spontaneity, that in, in and of itself is like, oh, like we're at a carnival. Like, I don't know what's on around the other corner, right? And mind you, they might've made love to the same body for 30 years. But the fact that you were selfish enough to only focus on what you wanted, and then you put, because in doing that, you were able to get excited and pull them in and obviously, if you happy mama, your partner's going to be happy, right? <laughs> like if, if you can do that well, then everything is going to work out um, because it won't be an exclusively selfish night. It will start with you knowing what you want, being really juicy, really flowy, really exciting. And then you will obviously return the favor in whichever way that looks like for you. Now, how does that confidence portray? Because obviously, you know, we're not going to be playing with honey in the boardroom. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. Well, <laughs> be able to, because how you do some things is how you show up in many things. And there's that mm -hmm. transferability, like we talked about earlier in your skill set, mm -hmm. that you can still command the room. Yeah. And it doesn't have to involve anything sexual. No, absolutely not. It's stepping into and reclaiming your power. So some people talk about the power of your voice. So that's where the, the breath techniques come in. There's a little bit of work that has to be done if you're having some challenges or insecurities around like public speaking, because even though it's in the boardroom of let's say 20 people, if you have to command the room for many people, that feeling feels like death, right? Like they're anxious, their bellies hurts, their palms are sweating, all that. So there's some pre-work depending on who you are and what's going on with you. And there's no judgment to need that pre-work. I was that I'm a public speaker now and I do keynotes all over the world with 5,000 plus people. I was in a position many, many years ago where I stood in front of a, a small group of 50 people and I wanted to throw up, right? Like, like it happens and there's a progression of, of practice makes better. There's no perfection, but practice makes better. So part of what that looks like, the honey example of coming into asking what you need would be positioning the room correctly. If you know that you don't feel good when you stand up in a room, because it's just for a lot of people who have issues with uh, commanding the room and public speaking, they don't like to be standing over anyone else. They prefer to be equal. 
then you pull your chair in a way that you're sitting down to start and you work your way up to being able to stand as you get into the flow of your presentation. You also start with story. Like it doesn't matter what the reason for the meeting is. If the meeting is about revenue and budget, you can still start with a story about your customer, about your client, about a power partner, a vendor relationship that matters to give hope to inspire the rest of the group and then get into the spreadsheets and whatever else that might've been less appealing for swords. But you being able to choose what you want is the same way as choosing, you know what, I want some texture. I want you to do this this way and do that the other way is the same way when you're in the boardroom saying, you know what, I have to position this to really meet me in the way that I need to be met. Now, obviously, post 2020 world, a lot of us are not physically in a room with anyone. We're doing Microsoft team meetings and Zoom meetings and all the things. And I've heard from many people that they don't like being on the spotlight of the video. Yeah. It bothers them profusely. They feel like they're in a fishbowl in a worse way than if they were physically present with people. So there are a few things to do. Like I tell people all the time when I have to do an interview, I, I'm not sitting down. If I was sitting down right now, Deborah, my head would be like below this point <laughs> on here because I'm sure even with like a pad in my chair because I'm little. So I want to hold in my whole power. So I stand up for every Zoom presentation or every video, I, whether we were recording this on video or not, I would be standing up because I know I get to hold my power and I'm more fully present. I'm less likely to tap my pen or my desk or to look at the emails coming through and notifications. Also blocking out any other distractions and closing all tabs. Like those are small things that you can do to basically set up your room and the way that's most appealing. The last thing that I would say for people who are really nervous about commanding the space virtually, the, one of the benefits of being on video is like you can stare at the top of the screen, whether you have a camera, like an outside camera there or not, no one knows that you're not looking at them. Mm. Just stare at the, at the top. You'll see the colors. Like I can see Deborah's hair as I'm staring at the top. Um, I can see a little bit of her background, but I don't actually see her face. Her face is really blurry when I stare at the top. So if I was really uncomfortable, I could just look there and command the dots that's on the top of my monitor versus being overly focused on any emotional expression or lack of expression that she might be giving me in the, the middle of this virtual experience. And you know, what's very interesting. My, my daughter was in an interview first time ever on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the pieces of feedback that she requested after to, from the interview, they said, well, you should have more eye contact. And I thought it was very interesting that they, they themselves didn't consider that she is looking at the screen, trying to look at them versus necessarily the camera. And it's not intentional that there's no eye contact because she's looking at the screen and your eyes divert away. Right. And it's not like she's purposely diverting her eyes. She's maintaining mm -hmm. eye contact with the person on the screen versus the camera. Yeah. And that, that was partially... Um, unfortunately for this company, and hopefully they turn out to be a really good company, but a lot of interviewers don't know how to interview. You know that, right? Um, so sometimes they're trying to look for ways to criticize and for it to sound constructive when they're not thinking, well, there's a dynamic here that wasn't here before. Yeah. When she's in front of you, obviously you can tell if she's looking to the left or to the right of your face. When you're on a screen, you don't know where someone's visual uh, mirror of you, basically the mirrored version of the other person is coming up. And if I didn't have this view set to where it was, you could be to the left of me and I would be looking to the left of me the whole entire time versus to direct because I happen to have you stacked on top of me right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Nikita, I don't know where this time has gone. <laughs> we, um, <laughs> I have so many qu more questions. I'll have to have you come back on the show. It's unbelievable. I looked at the clock and I was like, whoo. <laughs> I welcome it. <laughs> Buckle, buckle in and go for the ride. And uh, thank you so much for joining us here on the Millionaire Woman Show. I have a couple more questions, which I know you've listened to the show. So be prepared. What is one book that has really transformed the way you approach life, the way you approach business, just to, that has shifted you in some way? Yeah, it's the book that I actually gift and recommend to everyone. I give to all my clients and I recommend to every power partner. Gay Hendricks' Big Leap was shifting for me. It's simple. I don't even think it's 150 pages, 
But if you really read it and reread it and reread it again, he speaks to your soul. That's one book I have to read. I put it on my list because I haven't read that one. And it always, love it. there's some that are repeatable that come up because one of the books that I often find and give away to people is the four agreements. And again, it's a quick read with impact. And I look forward to adding this one to my shelf as well. And that was the big leap by Gay Hendricks. Awesome. Okay, Nikita. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. With the show here, we talk about life, leadership, and business, helping people live rich from the inside out. What does it mean to you mm -hmm. to live rich from the inside out? Mm, for me, that would look like living fully in all of my flaws that I have chosen not to fix because some you fold in, right? You know, like I talk uh, with about out the side of my mouth, I have a little bit of a list. So that's technically a flaw for someone else's perfectionistic standard. I've decided to fold that in and embrace it and not to hide it or justify it, you know, just to use that tiny example. So for me, it's really being a woman of integrity. If I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. If I can't, I will put up the boundary around it. I use a system for me to live rich fully on everything where I kind of do a check of whether or not I'm going to say yes to someone because I don't want to default into old behaviors of just saying, yes, 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 I'll do it, I'll do it, you know, being the, the master of everything um, when I really just want to be great at what I'm purposed to do. Uh, so for me, it really does come down to choosing my opportunities and not just taking every opportunity that comes to me. And it's amazing to me that, you know, you point out something that you see as a fly. That I don't even notice it. So I was like, what is she talking <laughs> about? You know, so it's amazing what we <laughs> define as a flaw, or maybe there was someone way back when who pointed it out as a flaw yet, you know, other people yeah. may not even notice it. So I, I always mm -hmm. find that all the kids growing up. <laughs> Like, what are they talking mm -hmm. about? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, Nikita, it's been such a pleasure to have you here on the show. We talked it, you know, talked about so many things. Catch acronym. Um, people, you need to go back and some take some notes, especially if you're driving and listening to us. Or if you get a chance, check us out on YouTube in our, you know, gangster looks in our hoodies. And really yes. getting comfortable with... <laughs> just having these discussions and increasing the heat, whether it be in the bedroom or the boardroom. And uh, Nikita comes with such valuable experience to share with you all. Now, Nikita, how can people stay in touch with you? Yeah, the best thing to do is to go to thinkpro.com. That's our website and it gives you links to all the other portals of our world. Uh, second best would just be email me at asknikita at thinkpro.com. Awesome, awesome. Um, two final words of wisdom. What what advice would you like to leave people with today? Mm. Give yourself the gift of selfishness. That's awesome. To really embrace that. <laughs> you know, I, I hear people mm -hmm. talk about, when they're talking about fitness, especially they talk about core before coffee or uh, body before business. So very interesting, mm -hmm. but it is really about you know, when, when you can give to yourself, you can definitely start giving more to others. Absolutely. Without regret and resentment, which is super crucial for you to create the joy you want in your life. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. Everyone, you can go over also to my website at www.debrakazowski.com. Right now you get your three-part video course of making habits stick to get rid of those derailers, build focus and consistency. The first C in Nikita's catch is consistency that we need in our lives. And we would love for you to hit the bell if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe, rate and review the show and share it with your friends. We would love for you to take a picture wherever you're listening, pop it in your story, tag us, and uh, we would love to hear from you your favorite part of the interview. As Muhammad Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world. And on behalf of Nikita and myself, go out and make today great.